Uh, I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes, and my talk is in two halves. And the first part um, is structured as, as if it were a, a conversation with a, a climate skeptic. And then in the second part, well, during that part, I'm going to argue that climate change is a very real, urgent um, issue, and it is something that architects need, need to address. And then in the second part, I'm going to look at one possible way in which architects can respond to the challenge of climate change. So starting with that, that first one, the conversation with the skeptic, and incidentally, I'm going to come on to that point about the 7,000 signatories, which is uh, quite a good one. Um, so this is going to start with some very basic positions. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because I guess some of you are, um, are pretty familiar with this. Um, those of you who, who do know these arguments, um, I'd, I'd like to suggest that you maybe re-familiarize yourself with some of these and think about how you might use these arguments yourself if you had to argue with a climate change skeptic. So th th this is going to start with very basic positions um, working through to the much more complicated ones. And, and the most basic position is this one. I'm not convinced that climate change is even happening. And, and there are one or two people who still seem to um, hold this position. Um, and actually, we have incredibly good data about how temperature and CO2 levels have, have varied o over the last 600,000 years. And a lot of that comes from the Vostok ice data. So um, this ice was laid down in, in layers over the years, and as it as it was laid down, it trapped little bubbles uh, within it. And so you can take a very accurate reading of the CO2 levels from that. And then by comparing the isotopes of oxygen, you can arrive at a pretty accurate picture of what the temperature was at the time. And what you see is that there's a, a very uh, close uh, correlation between temperature and carbon dioxide. And where we are now um, is at about, um, just above where it says present concentration, we're at about 385 parts per million. And that's, that's higher than it's been for about 3 million years. Um, and with business as usual, it's going to carry on going, going up and up. And we, we know that CO2 is not the only greenhouse gas, and it's certainly not the most potent one, but it is the one that is emitted in by far the largest quantities. So I think it is, one of the, um, it is the most sig significant one that we should talk about in terms of uh, causing climate change. And we're already seeing a, a very significant increase in the frequency and the intensity of extreme weather events, not just hurricanes, but also floods and, and droughts and, and so on. And we also know from controlled experiments that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. It, it uh, reflects um, the, the heat, and it does produce the buildup of, of um, heat within the atmosphere. So there's, there's actually very little doubt that climate change is happening. We know, it's a, we know that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. Um, we know that CO2 levels have been increasing. We know that uh, global temperatures have been increasing. So th those, those who, um, who say that the case has not been proven um, 100%, I, and generally those are in some of the more sort of sceptical parts of the media, I'd suggest they re don't really understand the nature of, of the science. Because with something as complex as the global climate system, you're, you're never going to get 100% proof. But uh, the overwhelming balance of, of, of scientific information suggests that climate change is happening. So the, the next skeptical position is, okay, climate change is happening, but it's not caused by humans. And um, that, that um, figure that the gentleman who was sitting at the front mentioned, the, um, the petition of, of 7,000 climate scientist signatories, well, that's known as the Oregon um, uh, petition. And um, George Monbiot wrote quite, wrote quite an amusing piece about this. Where he, he's actually such a thorough journalist that he looked through the list of signatories and found that it included people such as Ginger Spice and um, a lot of others with comparable levels of, of scientific knowledge. And it was, it's, it's been comprehensively debunked, um, and it was brought about by a fundamentalist Christian organization. So, you know, I really forget about that one. There, there are one or two slightly more convincing skeptical positions that, that fit into this one. Um, and the two most common ones are that it's to do with um, solar fluctuation or it's the result of natural uh, sources of CO2. So let's have a look at each of those. Now, the first one, well, we certainly don't have records of solar intensity anywhere near as, as extensive as the Vostok ice data. But we do have records going back about 400 years. And there's, there's absolutely nothing in the trend that we've, we've seen in those 400 years that would correlate with the very dramatic warming that we've seen just over the last 100 years. 
And since 1978, we've had very, very precise readings of solar intensity. And it does vary. There are uh, dark spots and bright spots, and it appears to follow a pretty regular 11-year cycle. Um, but once again, within that, there's no dis discernible upward or downward trend. And yet, in, in that time scale of the last 40 years, we've seen very substantial uh, warming of the atmosphere. The, the next one um, is that uh, this is one of the other uh, commonly advanced skeptical positions, which is that it's actually the, the result of natural sources of carbon dioxide. And um, it, it is true that natural sources, such as swamps and volcanoes and so on, the, the volumes that you're talking about of CO2 and methane from those are far larger than man-made sources. But um, if you just think back to that data, the Vostok ice core data, what you see there is, is that it, um, CO2 levels have varied uh, within a fairly even band. Um, so the, the sources of CO2, the natural sources of CO2, have been balanced by the, the natural sinks. And it was maintained in, in a, a, a relatively steady state. Now, the other thing that um, w we can tell from um, atmospheric carbon is that by com com comparing different isotopes of carbon, you can get a pretty good picture of where that's come from. Fossil fuels have virtually no radioactive isotopes left because they're, they're very, very old, so the, the most of the half-lives have decayed. Um, and all the increases in CO2 that we've seen over the last 150 years can be attributed to anthropogenic emissions. So um, I, I, I would argue, therefore, that that argument really doesn't hold water either. But both of those have, have been used extensively by um, often by quite big organizations that have been set up to, to undermine climate science. And arguably, there, there was no organization that did that more effectively or more aggressively than the Global Climate Coalition. That was um, a, a grouping of, of big businesses, a lot of them oil industries and car industries, um, set up in the mid-'80s. And critics accused them of using underhand tactics um, to, to undermine climate science. Um, and what happened was that they, they gradually started to find it more and more difficult to maintain unity amongst their members, um, particularly after the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued their first and then their second report. Um, and what happened was that one of their most prominent members broke ranks. Um, and Lord Brown, who was the chief executive of BP at the time, issued this um, quite historic speech in a way, uh, in which he said that the time to consider the policy dimensions of climate change is not when the link between greenhouse gases and climate change is conclusively proven, but when the possibility cannot be discounted. We in BP have reached that point. So they, they left the, the Global Climate Coalition. They were promptly followed by a number of others, including Shell and Ford and Daimler Chrysler and, and, and so on.